I want you to take a <clears throat> moment. I want you to think about the ideal the ideal man in your life, someone who has influenced you in such a way that when you look at his life, you don't see perfection, but you see a man who has staying power, a man who is steady, strong, man who is trustworthy, a man who is a man of his word. And I want you to think of that person. It could be your biological father. It could be your adoptive father. It could be someone, could be a grandfather, could be someone who stepped in your life, came in at a time when you needed that person the most. And I wonder who that person is for you. And then the next thing that I would ask you to do this morning is I want you to, if you haven't done so already, take a moment and go to God and say to him, Lord, thank you for that man. Thank you for that man. Thank you for sending him into my life. Many of us would not be here if it wasn't for the steady hand, for the firm hand, and sometimes, yes, the difficult hand of a man that we call dad or father. I know that from the standpoint of many of us men, ourselves, I ask us men, where would we be men if it wasn't for the steady hand of someone? A man who cared for you, loved you. As I said earlier in the beginning, it's, we're not talking about a perfect person. We know from God's word that the only perfect man who walked this earth was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This morning I have a double duty and that is to speak to us about fathers and at the same time cover the path that we've been on as we've been talking about deacons and serving in our church. And the more I looked at the text here this week, the more I realized that there's a lot of things that are similar. And so, even though many of our men in our churches are not called upon or do not feel called upon to serve in the area of deacon, it is interesting to read this text and to discover that the, the qualities, the characteristics that are required of a man to serve in this particular office, as we call it in our churches, uh, happens to be uh, the same qualities and the same requirements uh, of someone who is a father, someone who is a dad. In fact, we'll look at that. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and go to 1 Timothy, the passage that we've been on for the last three weeks, and uh, chapter 3. And this morning we're going to look at two verses that we have not looked at before and revisit verse 13 uh, as we bring this series to a close. But remember that in the coming days we will begin the process of searching and we have a process here in this church by which we will... Uh, do that. But I, I wanted us, since this is my first time with you as a pastor and dealing with this particular area, I wanted us to 
uh, go over that subject uh, one more time so that we can uh, get to know one another and, uh, and you get to know my heart and where I stand and what I believe the Bible teaches about this uh, important uh, office. And so, if you will, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Would you stand with me? Let's read this word, and then we will pray, and we will go to God's message. Beginning in verse 11, Paul writes to Timothy, this young pastor, and he says, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. Now, Lord, I pray that you help us to come to an understanding of what it means. Lord, I know that this, these two verses have been for some time in the body of Christ uh, subject of lots of debate, subject to all kinds of discussions. And Lord, we pray that this morning you would give us clarity and understanding. But also, Heavenly Father, I pray that you give us compassion and a warm heart so that as we talk about the subjects that are involved in this text, Lord, that you would be glorified, that your name would be lifted up, that the body of Christ would be edified, and that all of us together, Lord, would be in harmony so that we can do what you call us to do, and that is to call from among us those that you are calling out to serve in the capacity and in the service and in the high calling that serving as a deacon is. And so, Lord, I pray that you guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I said in my prayer, I, I am aware of the, the controversies that we have had over the years uh, with these particular passages. Even among us as Southern Baptists do not fully agree totally and completely on what these verses mean. Not only do churches have variations of what they believe it teaches, even some of God's greatest, greatest pastors and greatest servants that have preached have differences about what it means. And as I have studied and read, I've read all of these great men's work and uh, and have come to the understanding that that with a slight uh, different approach uh, we arrive at different conclusions. The good thing is that most of us, now I say most of us, I'm talking about us pastors, most of us, the, the ones that I think stand on God's word, believe God's word, uh, with very few differences stand pretty much in agreement on the very major and basic teaching that we have in this particular text. And so I want to start out by first saying to us this morning that in my view it is no accident that Paul starts in verse 8 when he talks about deacons and even elders that he talks about he starts at their public service and if you will, for just a second in verse 8, he says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent. And he's talking about their character and how they are. And then he adds in there that in public, in the public view, and when he, when he, mentioned, when he talks about public, he's not just referring to uh, within the church body, he's referring to uh, outside of the body. That is to say, the world out there. We use terms like the world or the lost or uh, non-believers or unbelievers and all that kind of stuff. So whatever word fits you, Paul says that these men who are to be chosen are men that in public they are to have a good reputation. That they are to be of a good reputation. That when when 
the world and the body of Christ both refer to this particular individual, he is one that both hold that man in, in, in high regard. Uh, he's a respected person. Uh, they, they believe that he is an honest individual. There is to be a view about this person that, that is good among all people. Not just Christians, but all people. Why does that matter? Because we have a message to deliver. And we have a witness to carry out. And so it matters because if there is anything in my life and our lives, men, that would hinder the gospel in one way, we must work in such a way that we address it, that we deal with it. We can't just cover it up and we, can't, and we certainly can't uh, make excuses uh, except to own up to where we are weak, where we fall, where we fail, and, and, and do everything that we can to walk with God as we've been taught. And, and again, when we fail and when we make mistakes, we correct that and, and, and don't allow those things to fester and, and, and ruin our testimony. And so, and so he starts out in the public arena and he says they, they've got to they've have a good, a good uh, report with all people. And then he takes it, in my view, and I, I believe that that is, though that may be public, that may be, some might consider that the highest view. I consider that the, 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 the beginning steps. Then he steps it up a notch, uh, and he goes, while he, while he may go deeper into the man's heart, he steps it up to a, even a higher level, and then he mentions his spiritual life, and he says, this man is a man who must hold faithfully to the mystery of the faith. And we talked about last time that what he is talking about here is his standing on the gospel, on what the Bible teaches about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, about the doctrines of the faith. He must be a man who has a firm grip on these teachings in the New Testament. He can't be a man who wavers. He can't be a man who doubts. He can't be a man who is not certain yet. He must be a man who's, who has a firm grip on the Bible teachings and all that relates to the mystery of the faith. Why is that important? Well, that is important because we are living in such a volatile world. Even among churches and even, even among denominations, we have wavering uh, ideas and ideologies and teachings about what the Bible teaches. And a lot of it that is out there today is nothing but fluff. A lot of it is things out there that tickle our ears and make us feel good. And we walk out of church in many places, people walk out of church feeling good, but not having been convicted, not having been changed, or as we like to say in the Bible, transformed. Well, I don't know about you, but I believe that the power of, of, of God is in the power of the gospel. Paul said it, he, that's why he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then he alludes and he says, because, and he gives his reason, because it, the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. The only message and the only power, the only message that God empowers and that His Holy Spirit flows through as if a wind were to flow through from one end of this sanctuary to the other. The only message that, that receives the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the only thing. As, as far as God is concerned, and no one else matters, as far as God is concerned, that has the power to transform the heart of a person from a life without God to a life with God. There's a lot of good messages out there, and there's a lot of feel-good messages out there. And some of them are very powerful and very persuasive. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, that means this preacher and every one of us in here, no one comes to the Father or to the Father but by me. That is exclusive. That eliminates a whole lot of other good, feel-good messages and very powerful and persuasive messages. Jesus stood in front of the crowd that he was talking to and he said, If you want to get to God, if you want to meet God, if you want to know who he is, I am the solution, I am the answer, I am the way, I am the truth. There is no other. Everything else is eliminated. 
And we cannot have men serving in our churches, whether they are preachers or whether they are deacons or Sunday school teachers and women for that matter, who waffle on the subject of the gospel. If they entertain even so much as an inkling that there is something other than the gospel that will get people to God, they cannot serve, they cannot teach, they cannot be part. Why? Because it goes contrary to what, not what this preacher said, but what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the reason we got all kinds of confusion and the reason we've got all kinds of religions and people popping up everywhere is because somebody waffled and wavered on the gospel and they felt like, well, you know, I have read the Bible. I've read it from Genesis to Revelation, but I've also traveled to this place and that place and I've also heard this message and I've heard that guy. And man, it sure sounds a lot like the gospel. They don't use the terminology we use. They don't use the words that we use, but it just really sounds really good and it and by the way while I walked out of there listening to that it really made me feel good well let me tell you something the gospel as loving and as powerful and as persuasive as it is does not tickle your emotions to make you feel good in fact it does the opposite it makes you feel uncomfortable because it does things like call us what we are Sinners. It points out to our sinfulness and how we're living by the standard. You say, what standard? Not this preacher. Not the deacon body in this church. The standard is the perfect one. Jesus Christ. That's the standard that we point to. And so, somebody somewhere wavered. We cannot have people in our churches serving, really in any capacity, if they waver on the gospel. If you believe that the gospel still stands and you take the cross out of it, that's not the gospel. If you believe that the gospel still stands and you take out the, 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 the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was born of a virgin, which so many theologians have done today in our society, they've taken the, birth, the, the whole birth issue out of it. She, he wasn't born of a virgin. She was a young woman. All this kind of stuff. If you take that out of there, it's not the gospel. And so Paul talks about his public life and then he talks about his spiritual life and what he believes about the mystery of the faith. By the way, the, the, the biblical view is that from Genesis to Revelation, God has been laying out that plan all across the board. All the saints in the Old Testament kept pointing to something that was coming, that something was someone. And over and over in Genesis, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in all these books, in Joshua, all these books, God has been just laying out his plan. And, and the further we come this way, the more light we get, and the more light we get, and the more light we get, until we get to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we get the fullness of time, and God reveals his Son. And from that moment on, we have now been telling the people he's not coming he's he, we're not waiting for him to come he has come and we point to the cross and we say there he is the one that God pointed from Genesis all the way to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and to his death on the cross there he is exposed before all the world the only way to get to God we the church are pointing back to the cross and say it he finally came there he is he came he lived he died and he resurrected and he ascended into heaven and he said he would come back and that that's exactly what we're telling the world. He is coming back and you better be ready. Amen. That is the kind of man that we need. That is the kind of man that Stephen was when he stood up before the people who challenged him. And the Bible tells us that no one could stand against him because they understood that he knew what he was talking about. And then that other deacon, Philip, who was preaching a revival... And God takes him from where he is and takes him into the middle of the desert to talk to an Ethiopian eunuch about what he was reading in the book of Isaiah. 
And he says, do you understand what that he's talking about? And he says, how can I if no one explains it to me? And from that moment on, the Bible, he said, the Bible says that Philip began to explain to him everything that there is to know about Jesus Christ. Notice that he didn't waste any time talking to him about anything else. He didn't talk to him about the pyramids in Egypt. He didn't talk to him about all this other stuff and about any cavemen we may have found in some cave or any of that junk. He talked to him about the person of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that at the end of that conversation, the Ethiopian eunuch understood so well that he said, Well, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Listen, can I tell you something? When we, men, when we allow the Holy Spirit to use us and to explain the gospel, any, every single one of us in here, men that I am talking to is a believer. When you allow the Spirit of God to use you and you explain this gospel as clear as you possibly can and allow the Holy Spirit of God to use you, let me tell you, when you walk away from there, there is no doubt in my mind that when you do it the way God wants you to do it, that person will either will understand exactly what you just presented and they will either choose to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or they will walk away from Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not part of confusion. When it, listen, why, why would the Holy Spirit cause somebody to be confused when we're talking about, as I said to you last week, the person's eternal destiny? Where somebody is going to spend eternity hinges on the clarity of the gospel. And we cannot have people serving in our churches and hopefully we will take the mindset that we cannot have people serving in any capacity in our churches who waver on the issue of the gospel. We may have differences about subjects such as the, 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 whether we are premillennialists or amillennialists or all of those kinds of things. We may have differences on those subjects and we may have differences on other subjects. But may I tell you and may I plead with you that on the subject of the gospel there must not be any compromise whatsoever. And so Paul starts at his public life and then he comes into his inner life, into his spiritual life and makes sure that that is correct. But I want to take you to what I believe is the highest look that Paul takes when it comes to looking inside the life, the heart of a man who is going to be chosen as a servant, whether he is an elder or a deacon. Paul goes into what I call the highest calling. He goes, into the, he goes into the life, into the area where we consider very private, very personal. And we guard it or protect it with all of our heart. And yet Paul goes and he says, in that one area... He must also rise to the level like the other two levels. He must be held to the highest standard in that particular area. And that is in the area of his domestic life. Or, as we would say, his home life. Now we are going to peer into, now we are going to walk into, in through the door of his home. And we're going to observe and we're going to peer. And, and many of us in here would cringe at the idea. And maybe you're sitting there and you're cringing. Because you say, wait a minute. Now you're getting very personal. Now you're coming into the area that I consider private. How many of you remember watching movies back in the day? And here you have this man and this woman and... No matter what, no matter what movie it was, whether it was some kind of a drama or some kind of adventure or whatever, and these two meet and they, they're going to solve a mystery or they're going to do something. And they suffer danger and all this and he rescues her or she rescues him. And, and, and in the process of that movie they fall in love and, and, and they become this great couple and but we get all excited. And then at the end of the movie, they come together 
And in some of the movies, they, they come so close, almost as if they're going to kiss, and then it ends right there. And you're like, what? What just happened? Or they come and they come to, the, to, to, to a, a door of some sort, whether it's a house or an apartment or something, and they come so close together and they repeat kind, loving words to one another. And then it is clear that there's a bond between those two. And they open the door and they close the door and the movie ends right there. Now back in the day, most of us understood that when they went behind that closed door, it is private, right? And whatever goes on behind that door, well, that's their business, right? And we didn't need any graphics to explain to us the possibilities, did we? We have a pretty good mind. And that's all that needed to be said. Today, we see the same movies, the same adventures. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how today Hollywood tries to repeat the same storylines, the same stuff as the older movies, but they add all the other stuff to it? Have you noticed that? Today, it is all out. It is graphic. It is, you don't, they don't let you think on your own. It's just all out there. And you know what I find amazing about us as Christians? Is that we think that's okay. We sit and watch it. But when it comes to Christianity and the church and the things of God and the holiness of the things of God, oh no, preacher, you're going too far. You can't go in my door. You can't go in there. You can't open that closet because, well, frankly, that's none of your business. Frankly, and yet, and yet, from those experiences, from those situations, we make decisions. Our life experience, the things that we've been through, are the ones that we use to make life decisions. Paul comes and he says, now, we've looked at his public life, we've looked at his inner spiritual life, now we must look at his domestic life, and that is not left to chance. And he mentions some things in here that I think are worthy to point out, and I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can. He says in verse 11, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Now, let me quickly just say this. Some theologians tell us that that word wives is the Greek word for woman. In other words, one theologian says this particular verse is not referring to the deacon's actual wife. It is referring to women. And what, he, and what he says, and others say, is what Paul is doing here in this particular verse, he is introducing into the mix a new office or a, an addition to the office, and that is, he, what they say is, this is referring to women deacons. And they use examples like Phoebe in the book of Romans where they talk about and she is referred to as a deaconess and so forth and so forth. And we get into that discussion. I am here to tell you that as I've read all of that and I understand, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I understand enough to tell you that while I humbly respect their opinion, I disagree with them. I've never seen Paul in any of his letters be talking on a particular subject and then, as a matter of fact, introduce a new doctrine and not give us any more verses on the subject than one verse. All my life I have been told as a preacher, you don't base your doctrine and your teaching on one verse. You take the whole of Scripture and what it says and that together forms an opinion on a doctrine. 
But here, some feel like they've got to take that verse and say, Aha! Here's the aha moment. I found it. I found the verse. I found the verse that gives us the freedom to do whatever. Well, that may be the case, but I'm telling you, I do not believe that Paul all of a sudden breaks away from his tradition and his traditional practice and the way he writes and all of a sudden says, by the way, right here in this verse, I'm going to introduce a new thing. It is contrary to what Paul does. I believe that the passage clearly and the context of the passage clearly teaches that he is referring to the wives of the men who are going to be ordained as deacons. And by the way, can I tell you something about the deacons wives? It is one of the most It is one of the most one of the areas that we have neglected in our churches. Listen to what he says about the wife of a deacon. He says, they must be reverent. In other words, it is the same quality that is required of the deacon that is in public, that they are to be held to a high standard, to a position of honor. When you look at this deacon, look into the, his domestic side, into his home, and the first thing that you run into is his wife. What kind of wife does he have? She must be reverent. Notice what else. She must not be a slanderer. The word slanderer there is the word that we, where we get our, our word devil from. It is the Greek word diabolos. Some one interpreter said she must not be a devil woman or have satanic influence. Cannot be someone who is a slanderer. The only way you can know if someone is a slanderer, if you observe and you watch and you hear and you listen over a period of time to discover, is this person someone who when, gets, when they get the opportunity, uses it as an opportunity to slander somebody? Is it someone who likes to gossip and likes to pick up fodder and, 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 and dwell on it and mix in it and, 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 and just thrive in it and then use it as if, if you would a sword or a weapon to cut somebody or to hurt somebody and to cause harm. If that's, if that's the kind of person that his wife is, then he doesn't qualify. Not a slander, temperate, that means you're self-controlled, you're calm. Faithful in all things. She must be trustworthy. You can't have a deacon whose wife is not trustworthy, is not faithful in all things. In service, and you can go on from there. What kind of walk does this person have? Then, we go a little bit deeper. And he says in verse 12, Let deacons be the husband or husbands of one wife. I'm not going to skim over any of this. I'm just going to tell you exactly what we have done in churches. The traditional view and the one that we have held in most of our churches for, or for an extended period of time has been the view that when Paul refers to here husband of one wife, he is referring to a man who is married, has always been married, and remains married. Okay? He got married. He got saved. He's still married. He's now serving in the church. He's still married to the same woman. And now he's being considered, he's, all, he's been married. And that has been the traditional view in most of our churches. And I want to tell you that up until recently, 
somehow, some way, and I don't understand really why, somehow, some way, we begin to deviate from that traditional interpretation. If you look back at, and not all, and I will say, not all denominations and all our people held that same view, but for the most part, most churches held that, that's what I call the traditional view. I choose to, I'd rather call it the ideal view. That would be the ideal thing. That would be, that is the greatest thing, I think, the ideal. We've, we've got a problem, though. The problem is that, well, let me just be blunt. Mankind is the problem. That, that is a perfect setting. That, that, that would work if you have a man who met his sweetheart when he was whatever age and they got married and they've been married for a long time somewhere in there maybe as a child and maybe as a youth or maybe somewhere as a young person he got saved still to this woman and his wife got saved and they begin to serve church and they've been in church and all of a sudden here comes that day and say well brother so and so and sister so and so we feel like you all qualify and, and you meet the standards and here you are and there we go and that's perfect that's ideal because you can look and say man there's nothing in that life that says there's anything wrong except that we have to scratch our head and say things like man I never knew that that couple had that problem right why why do we run into that scenario? Why? Why? Because we're human. And while I like that view and have held that view for a long time and still do, I think it's still great. We ought not to shun from that. Jesus talked about divorce. He said, here is God's ideal. Marriage between a man and a woman. That's God's ideal. And that's what God initiated. And that's what he wants. And that's what he designed. It fits perfectly well with his plan. But then he said, but then Moses, because of the stubbornness of your heart, or their heart, permitted, opened the door to the subject of divorce. And so that's the traditional view. He must be a husband, he must be a man of one wife. The Greek passage really is this. A one woman man. You say, well preacher, that's not very helpful. That doesn't solve a lot. Now you see why we preachers and theologians have a challenge. Because the phrase is a one woman man. So then naturally the question arises, well, does that mean that one woman only, as you just described in the traditional sense? Or does that mean that he currently, right now, in his present state, is a one woman man? In other words, he doesn't have eyes for anyone else except the one that he is married to now. And I have to tell you that if we're going to be honest and sincere about what the text says and what it reads, without influencing it, it means exactly that. That right now, he has eyes for her, meaning his wife, only. That means that in his person and in his character, he doesn't have wandering eyes or wandering hands or wandering feet. Do I need to be any more explicative than that? Do I need to... He's not a floater. He's not a swimmer. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. He's not one of those kind of people. I believe that's what the text teaches. 
And then we get into the whole issue of, well, can it be a diverse, divorced person? Can it, can, what, what about a single man and all these subjects? Listen, we can debate those subjects. We can talk about those things. What I can tell you about divorce is this. And by the way, can I say something here about divorce? Let me just stop here to say just one thing about divorce. First, I am not sitting here in judgment of those who have been through divorce. I am not saying to you that divorce is the unforgivable sin. Lord, if it was, then there's many of us in here who have committed a whole lot worse sins than divorce. And we shouldn't even be here. And so, what I believe that Paul is addressing here is he's addressing the home life of a married man and he is saying he cannot be a wanderer in his home life. He cannot be a man who has eyes, ears, and feet for his wife and someone else. And if he does, and, and watch this, listen, we say, well, how in the world would you know that? If you don't take a look, you have to take a look. And by the way, we know this, that kind of lifestyle, sooner or later, gets around. As I say to people often about a number of subjects, Lubbock is a pretty big town. And you can get away with some things for a while. But Lubbock is not Houston or New York City or Los Angeles. You know what I'm talking about? You get my drift? Sooner or later, somewhere, somehow, something, some, somebody, someone knows and knows someone who does and on it goes and before long. But let me give you something else to worry about. That's even worse than that. The Bible in the Old Testament tells us, says this about your sin and my sin. It says, your sin will find you out. That means, in American terms, means this. Your sin is a snitch. Just saying. So if you don't like snitches and you think snitches get... Stitches, then you better start ditching your sin. <laughs> what is Paul alluding to here? He is alluding to purity in all of your life. In your current setting, are you pure? Are you holy? Are you devoted? Can you be found faithful? How do we know that a man can be found faithful in his inner life that we can't see like his doctrinal positions? How do we know if a man is out there in the public view held to a high regard if we are not out there with him all the time? You go to the highest source where you can find that evidence and that is you walk through his front door. Then you examine and you evaluate the man's home life. And you make sure that to the best of his human ability and to the best that he can and has tried to serve God, he, you find him faithful. By the way, the, the verse that says, and they are to be tested, the word there, tested, is a word, it's a verb, it's, it's not the error, it's tense in the Greek, which means that it, it starts and then it ends. It's the, it's the, I can't remember the other, the other uh, tense, but it is a tense that means this. It means that you test him, and you keep testing him, and you keep testing him, and you keep testing him. You know what we do in our churches? Here's what we do in our churches. We watch him for six months, watch him for a year, watch him for three months, depending on the church. We say, oh, he's, he's qualified. Thank you very much, ordained. God bless you. We all go home, have cake, punch and cookies, and we forget about his life. Six months down the road, we wonder why in the world, what's going on over there? What happened? What? 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 Well, I would have never. Really? Because Paul says, 
that we are to be constantly testing, checking, evaluating. That's why in our churches we have things like meetings and things where we evaluate and talk and ask questions and observe and pray for one another and do all of those things. Because listen to me. If we would do that like we're supposed to as Christians instead of crying like the world who says, you can't judge me. <laughs> My God. But if we would do our homework, we could go to this possible, well, I don't know, not, this couple right here. <laughs> We could go to this couple right here and we could be observing and watching and praying and we might be able to detect there may be a problem here and we could pray with them and cry with them and try to help them and counsel them and if we can't counsel them, give them some counsel to help them overcome that so they can remain together and be together. But because we're so private and we don't want anybody to find out our business and we talk about, don't put my business out there like dirty laundry, we all that kind of stuff and we as a church have hurt ourselves because because of that and we have hurt our reputation in the world when in the book of Acts the church the lost would look and say man wow that's something great God is doing over there that's amazing that's powerful you want to go in oh, I ain't going in there <laughs> they require too much they require too much change. There's something happening in the heart of those people. It's changing them. And I knew that guy right there. He was a drunk. She was a prostitute. Now she won't even look at me. Why? Because something happened in the heart of those people. And he said, oh, I ain't going in there. You, 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 you go in there, you come out changed. Exactly. That's what the gospel is supposed to be doing. It's transforming people. Man, my Latino side came out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, folks, I don't profess to be a Greek theologian. But I know and I'm smart enough to know that we get so caught up in whether can a single man do this or that or the other. Listen, there is a place for single men that God has given the gift of singleness to serve. There is a place and a time where God, if a man has straightened out his life, and he is on track and he's living wide and he is a one woman man and we, and we as a church examine that and live that and he can serve, he can serve. But listen, let's quit using the measuring stick of the world. We have our own measuring stick right here and we are God's body and listen, whatever we make mistake in, God will correct if we will allow the, God, the Holy Spirit of God to help us and correct us. But we must be the church and I really don't care what the world thinks of what we do around here. Except that when they look at us, they say, Man, I like what they do in that place. I don't know if I can be a part of it because I just don't meet that standard. Guess what? You don't. But neither did we before we came in. But Jesus got a hold of my neck and he got a hold of my heart and he got a hold of my head and he got a hold of my feet and my hands and my eyes and he did something inside of me and I no longer view sin in that way and I no longer want to be like the world and I don't want to smell like them and I don't want to be like that because there's something supernatural that happened and I can't explain it all except to tell you Jesus did something in my heart I guarantee you if a church starts living that way people will be making a mad dash to a church to say I want to be a part of that because they love you they care about you and they treat you right and yes when you make a mistake they point it out but they pick you up and say God loves you Men, some of you in here qualify and you ought to serve. And you shouldn't be looking at and looking down on yourself because of it. And listen, and listen men, if we, if, if we come to the point where we say, you know what, biblically you just don't. That doesn't mean that you can't serve somewhere else and do something else that God can use you in. I said to you two years ago from this very pulpit, I said, we desperately need men to serve. That's not to exclude our women who are faithful and loving and kind, but men, for God's sake, we need godly men to stand, by, stand up to the pulpit and stand up to the world and stand here and do what we're supposed to do.
And I am calling you out today. And not, not me. God saying to you, sir, if you come remotely close and you qualify and you can serve, would you please serve because we desperately need you. Let the Holy Spirit of God disqualify you if that's the case. Father, I come to you this morning and I thank you for your word. And Lord, I know that there are things that may not be settled. But we have differences of opinion and differences of interpretation. But Lord, this is your body. This is your church, not mine. I am an under-shepherd serving here, Lord, and I, I can be corrected and I can be taught and I can learn. But Lord, what we do not want to do is make a mistake because we were not careful enough to take our time and do it right. And for that, Lord, we need you and we need your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, as we begin the search of the people, the men who are to serve in that capacity, Father, would you bring those men to the surface? Only you know who they are. And you've been preparing them for some time. Father, would you draw them out? Lord, if there's someone here who's never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, been playing with the world and pretending to be and not, would you change their heart today? Those who are looking for a church or need to follow Jesus in believer's baptism, Father, whatever that is, would you bring them this morning? In Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand with us? We'll take just a few moments. If God has spoken...